Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and this is my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. Um, you may have noticed that I wasn't here in this capacity last week. I did finish <laughs> editing and put up the last of the huge European book haul that I did from the trip, the month long trip that we took in Europe uh, earlier this year for my sabbatical. So uh, that's finally done. It, it, it was just a long time in having to edit it. Uh, so thank you for your patience. And uh, if you haven't checked it out, they sit in my catch and release playlist uh, that I put together. So I'll put a link to that below. But I have read a bunch of books, so let's get straight into it because I wanna catch you up on some. So the first one I wanna bring you up to speed with is this. This is Nancy Midford's foray into biography. Uh, this is The Sun King. Uh, Nancy Midford, as you may know, uh, I, I'm fascinated with the Midford family, very interesting, eccentric people. Uh, this is Louis XIV and his building of Versailles and uh, all of the intrigue that happened at court and during those, those times. This is a dense book. <laughs> it's, it's dense. There are a ton of characters, ton of characters. Um, the names are a little challenging to remember who is who. And then we're talking about uh, courtesans, <laughs> um, generals, um, uh, members of royalty, mistresses, princes, princesses. It, it just, it goes on and on and on. I wish there almost had been a chart of <laughs> who all these people were. Uh, but there's, it, it, I'm really impressed with how she did this. Uh, it's thoughtful. It's very, it feels very well documented, very well researched. But at the same time, it, she brings the Midford, um, whimsy and um, air of ridiculousness to it. An example is there's a whole section, brilliant section about uh, how at one point there were an epidemic of poisoners. Yeah, poisoners. People were being poisoned uh, and, be and and so all of, they had to kind of start rounding up all of these people and they were just poisoning each other left and right. <laughs> killing each other, poisoning each other. Um, it was a big, big, big problem. And the king had, was like, do I, some of these were really close and intimates with him. Like, does he kill them? Does he have them tried and killed? Uh, does he just exile them? It was, it became a big problem. Another thing that she talked about, which is so funny, so macabre, it was that people were terrified of somebody dying in, in uh, in state while well, while at Versailles because everyone was called in to witness the body and witness the autopsy. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> right? So gross. Um, and so you talk about the horrors of that of that. Um, but you know, it's it, it's if you're interested in French history, if you're interested in Mid in Nancy Midford specifically, I say give it a whirl. Uh, there are probably gonna be sections that like me, you skim, uh, but I found it well worth my time and I'm looking forward to getting into some of her other uh, biographies because I just think she's she can really capture what was happening a, a, with a way that is a, uh, a little tongue in cheek and a little fun, a little more fun than some traditional historians. So there we go. Good, good job, Nancy. Then uh, with Sean of uh, Past Story Time, uh, she led a group read of this. Oh, this book. This is Let the Record Show, A Political History of Act Up New York, 1987 to 1993 by Sarah Shulman. Uh, this book. This is phenomenal. I'm gonna come out the gate and say, I gave it five stars. Uh, I'm someone who doesn't give that lightly. It means that I'll reread it. it it's, it's the top of the echelon. It means there's something so powerful about it that I wanna revisit, I wanna come back to. Uh, this is a oral history. Sarah Shulman was a member of ACT UP, so she knows of which she speaks. Uh, and she was able to have conversations and interviews with people uh, who were in ACT UP during the years that she was involved in it as well. And there's still many people who are still here, 
obviously a great number of people uh, have passed away because of the AIDS crisis. Let me explain a little bit about what ACT UP was just to kind of catch you up to speed if you, if you aren't as familiar. So ACT UP was an activist organization made up of people who were living with HIV. And at the, this time in the uh, 80s and early 90s, uh, there was a lack of support, a lack of, of policy, a lack of, lack of medication, research, uh, anything, any support or help from the government or from the pharmaceutical industry uh, for people who were living with HIV and AIDS. And this group was, uh, people were dying. They were absolutely dying. And a group of people got together, um, Larry Kramer, the most famous and outspoken member of ACT UP, but, all, but far from being the leader. Uh, this was kind of a leaderless movement filled with people who were, who were trying to impact change uh, for themselves, for their community. Uh, and they did it in two phases uh, or two areas of focus. One is in action, direct action, and so this was kind of the uh, creative element that um, created these pop-up moments of, of uh, confrontation with, with leaders in the FDA, in the CDC, also in the church. The church was, was imposing all sorts of, of difficulties for people living with HIV and AIDS because of the dynamic that many people suffering from HIV and AIDS were gay and or drug users or um, from came out of the prison system. And so uh, it was seen as a moral disease. Uh, the other, the, uh, so one side was this activist, creative, direct action. The other side was uh, people who were really focused on what policies need to be changed, what policy, what did they want to happen? How could they Im make sure that that gets implemented by pressure to ensure that they, they got certain things applied and certain things done in, in service of this community. It's amazing the types of things they, they got done. And today we owe a lot of the benefits of the COVID vaccine to earlier vaccine trials and things that were done for uh, people with HIV and AIDS. Uh, so the book is, this oral history of this group, uh, it's broken into uh, really organizational thinking. Uh, so they, it's not just like a timeline, uh, but it's more how they organize successes that they had, specific events um, and actions that they had, um, different factions, and it serves in essence as a handbook for future generations to think about what policy and direct action could look like in the future. And also what are some things to prevent and to look, to think about as an organization is, is doing well and making ground roads. Because at a certain point, they started finding some successes and they started getting into trials. They started getting better medicines. They started um, developing a better uh, policy to, uh, of what the definition of AIDS was. So at a certain point in time, uh, a person could be suffering horribly, could be uh, emaciated, horribly, horribly uh, suffering uh, the ravages of the disease, but the definition, it, unless it fit a certain standard, would not apply to them. And this was especially true for women. Women had different symptoms than men had. And so they fought to get that, that definition changed. And once that definition was changed, people were able to access the type of healthcare that they needed. But without that definition changing, they would never have been able to do that. And that was a profound, profound um, uh, accomplishment of this group. So it, here, you know, seeing how hard they fought for it, um, how challenging it was for these people to organize from cross sections of life, uh, cross sections of society, uh, while they're also dealing with so many people were actually HIV positive them, themselves, um, was fascinating. 
fascinating, uh, very heartwarming um, to see all of those accomplishments, heartbreaking to read about all of the people that passed away just months before the change that they had been fighting for actually happened. Um, that was really, really hard to read. It was also hard to read about how uh, the women's causes, getting women's issues put front and center was really ignored by a lot of the people who were pushing policy um, because they they were making inroads to that they've been wanting to make. So they didn't want to rock the boat and and expand the some of these definitions to include some of the things that women were going through specifically. And almost almost working against each other uh, within within the organization. That was heartbreaking to read. Uh, this is incredibly thought provoking. Uh, it was really great. I did a combination of listening to it in audio and reading it um, physically reading this book. And I think that was a really good a good way to go. You don't hear the individual voices. That's the only thing that's that's difficult. It would have been phenomenal to hear all of the people that they interview in their own voices, but that wasn't that wasn't possible. So sometimes that ended up being a little challenging. In the narr in the audiobook, but cannot cannot speak more highly of this. It was absolutely phenomenal, and I hope more people would pick it up. Thank you, Sean, for for setting this up so that uh, I decided to pick it up now. Then I listened to an audiobook. This is It Girl by Ruth Ware. Now I really like Ruth Ware for my palate cleansing, uh, thriller, light thrillery types of books. She's got a mystery writer. Uh, I think I've mentioned before that I don't like thrillers where um, someone's being targeted and stalked. Um, and so when it feels like there's a hunted and a hunter, I, I, can't, I don't have time with that. But I do like um, psychological suspense and, uh, and this one was really good. Um, and I think specifically I liked it because I kept thinking that it was a different person. And so she did a good job at, at twirling me around uh, in who could be uh, the culprit. So the story, it's set in Oxford, again, one of my favorite places on earth, and it features April and Hannah who meet on their very first day at Oxford. And they have kind of like a shared suite where they have their own individual rooms, but they share kind of a, a shared space together. And uh, Hannah is incredibly uh, wealthy, socialite, uh, one of these girls that just sparkles, beautiful, everyone wants uh, to be in her orbit. April is not. April's just kind of a normal, uh, a normal girl who just kind of gets swept into to, uh, Hannah's orbit. We open with uh, something happening uh, that she hears, she's getting, uh, April's getting some phone calls and she hears something on the news that a man has died in prison. And this man was, uh, was guilty, found guilty of the murder of someone. And we find out that the murder was Hannah. Hannah was, was murdered in their suite. And apparently April was the one was one of the people who found her and it was so shocking to her that she's she blacked out she does not remember but she remembered just enough to be able to convict this man of the crime and uh his his death has kind of opened some fissures up and not that she remembers more but she's starting to have some questions and people are, are other people who were there around the same time are starting to question she has ended up with and married to with a with a child on the way of of Hannah's ex-boyfriend. And so she and Hannah's boyfriend have ended up together after this event. And uh, that creates a little complexity in in her starting to think back about this. It's something that he doesn't want to talk about anymore. He just wants to move forward. And she's not feeling good about some of the questions that have come up about this man's potential innocence. Uh, and so she starts to investigate and I will leave it there. Um, this was, like I said, twisty turny. It's modern day. It was fun romp. I did the audiobook narrated by Emma Jean Church, and I think she did a really good job. And yeah, if, so if you're looking for a uh, summer thrillery type of thing, uh, this could this could be a good one for you.
Then I'm doing a, a reading through the Barchester series with my good friend Leo. He's on Instagram as Leo's Little Book Life. And he and I do most of our reading together. He'll, he'll pop up in two other times later on in this, in this uh, list. But he had already read Dr. Thorne, but we read Barchester Towers together. So this is Barchester Towers is number two. Dr. Thorne is number three. The Warden is the first one. So he, unlike me, just kind of dove right in and, and read Dr. Thorne without starting at the beginning. I, of course, started at the beginning with, with The Warden. So he had to catch up with The Warden. And then we both started Barchester Towers together. So Barchester Towers is the story of the bishop who, upon his deathbed, creates this, this power vacuum that all of these people in the church uh, in this town of Barchester start to try to fill. And it sets off all of these really interesting power dynamics, be specifically between this woman, Mrs. Prody, and a gentleman named Obadiah Slope. Interestingly enough, uh, I had tried to read Tristram Shandy uh, by Thomas Stern earlier in the summer with Roz of Scal Dandling about the books. And I gave up about 30% of the way in because it just was, was, I wasn't enjoying it. However, I did see the connection. So there is an Obadiah, uh, Obadiah is one character and Dr. Slope is another character in the in the book that uh, Tristram Shandy. So it was kind of funny that I was like, oh, I see what you're doing there, Trollope. Um, so it, yeah, so there's a lot about power and we have our, our dear warden, uh, which is Mr. Hardy from the previous book. And he is without a job and there's an opportunity to maybe reinstate him into uh, becoming the warden which would make a lot of people very happy. But there, the power that's happening and the kind of machinations behind the scene uh, are really complicating that. And Obadiah Slope is leveraging the wardenship uh, to kind of facilitate some, some things that he wants to see done. And so it's, it's Trollope, so you're gonna get a lot of deep characterization, really fun, slow, long, enjoyable passages, and, and you just take your time with a Trollope novel. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. We also have Eleanor Bold, who in The Warden was, I don't wanna, I don't wanna give too much away if you haven't read The Warden, uh, but she also appears in this one and gets involved in, uh, she's, she's seen as a prize uh, by many people and to very interesting, uh, interesting outcomes. So enjoy Barchester Towers very much. I was still in the, in the spirit of like, well, I think the Palliser series is better. Uh, in, but, you know, we're only two volumes in. So I go into Dr. Thorne, and at this point, I'm on my own. Leo's already read this, so I'm trying to catch up. And I have to say, I loved Dr. Thorne. Loved it, loved it, loved it. So in this one, we've got Mary, a new character, Mary, and she is the illegitimate uh, niece of Dr. Thorne. And Dr. Thorne, like Mr. Hardy, are just decent men. They're just decent, wonderful, decent, honorable, thoughtful men. Uh, and he has taken on Mary and he is raising her as his niece. And because of his position, he, she has entree to, to parts of society that she wouldn't be if people really knew about her lineage, uh, that she's illegitimate. And this causes some challenges because Frank uh, is a child who is who she grows up with, who falls in love with her, and he wants to marry her. But uh, he is landed gentry, and he needs to marry money because they need the money for the family. Mary has none, uh, and so that becomes a bone of contention. And uh, Thorne knows this. He knows about it's a secret that he's holding close. Uh, but there's something in the horizon that changes everything for everyone, that he is one of the few people who understands all of the ramifications. Uh, I I absolutely loved it. I, what I love about Trollope, I mentioned the characterizations. Like he does such a good job at really 
very few of the characters are wholly bad or wholly good. There's always a mix. There's always um, interesting aspects of how he creates characters. And the slow, play, the slow pace is, I just, I sink into them. I love spending my time with them. I even love when you know what's coming, the slow trickle of it, of it happening. You know, I am someone who lives for anticipatory joy. I, I am, I am that person who loves an advent calendar, <laughs> who, who likes to know it's coming and then slowly, te you know, getting closer, closer and closer. So for me, Trollope just hits all of the spots. Next up, speaking of something that didn't hit all the spots, <sighs> Anita. This is Anita Bruckner, uh, The Bay of Angels. I just have to ask, Anita, what woman did you so wrong, so wrong in your past? The first half of this book showed a lot of potential. We have Zoe. Zoe's a young woman uh, living with her widower, her widow mother, and uh, the mother meets a man, Simon, a very lovely, nice, kind man who is has a lot of money. And he marries the mother and uh, ships her off with him to the south of France, where they live in this villa and have this really wonderful, apparently wonderful life. And she is uh, starting her life and she's very excited to start her job and finish her degree and and she has a bunch of boyfriends and she she's seemingly like not a Bruckner woman, uh, young and uh, focused on the future with potential and options. Uh, there is, uh, I don't want to say too much about it. Look, Anita Bruckner's books are blessedly short. They're usually under 200 pages. So something happens which changes the dynamic and the nature of everyone's future in this family. And it then it just kind of degrades into uh, the same tropes that she always employs about how women are just basically only really come to life under the 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 blinding light and radiance that is men's love. <laughs> Without a man's love, a woman just kind of withers and dies and isn't worth talking to, uh, isn't worth existing. And it's just a sad, it's a sad trope. The fact that this was written in 2001 is just un unbelievable. Uh, it's like she's packed in resin and she cannot see modern day at all. It's like, it, so... This is, I think we only have like three more, but we're gonna finish this before the end of the year, our project of reading all of Anita Bruckner's work. Um, but suffice it to say, this was not a good one. Don't recommend it. Um, both Leo and I had a complete venting session in, on Voxer about this. So yeah, again, I'm really looking forward to Hermione Lee's biography that should be coming out soon, hopefully next year. Uh, so we can find out who hurt Anita. <laughs> why, why is she the way she is? Ugh. But the, and, and again, let me say, her writing is exquisite. Her sentence structure is beautiful. And so you can read, if you care about that kind of thing, you can read even some of her, the ones that we we're more annoyed with and still find it beautiful on that sentence structure. It's just the, the, the constant, uh, misogyny that that exists in here is is a it's a lot and then i just finished this book this is tomb of sand by jitanjali shri and translated by daisy rockwell really love this is a tilted access press edition i just think it's really beautiful this is such an interesting book there is a lot here and I'm so thankful that uh, that so many brilliant people joined me on, in a group read to try to, to approach this together because on my own, I think I would have been intimidated. I don't know that I would have been able to continue. But so many people saw so many different things and brought it to the forefront, uh, both from culturally uh, to people who are seem to be just excellent at pulling apart text and understanding 
uh, how things are constructed to people who are just very literate and understand uh, metaphors and symbolism and and then and then just people who read like me who just really enjoy uh, exploring a text. Uh, this was challenging. It was challenging in the sense that it's not structured like a Western novel. It meanders. It goes in all sorts of different directions. But it was incredibly powerful at, 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 in certain scenes, uh, very visual, uh, took me places that I didn't expect, taught me a lot. Uh, the story, I should say, is... It's hard to explain because there's so many things that happen, but there is a mother and a daughter and a son. They're all adults. The mother is in her 80s. She originally lives with her son and his wife and family, and she is kind of withdrawing from the world after the death of her husband. Uh, she uh, kind of gets up and starts wandering and wanders away. Upon her return, she goes to live with her daughter, who does not, is not married, is kind of living more of a Western, uh, independent type of life. She's kind of pushed aside some of the traditions. And it's here that one of, her, one of Ma, uh, the mother's friends uh, comes and spends a lot of time with her. And, and it's, her name is Rosie, and she's a hijira, uh, a transgendered person. We And then it be kind of flows into what happens between these characters, as well as what's happening in the world around them, the physical world. Uh, then, then we go into, ultimately, it, there's a lot of talk about borders and walls and, and separation. And ultimately, I don't wanna, I can't really spoil it because it goes in so many different directions, but a very big part of it is the partition. Uh, is the splitting of, of India and Pakistan into two different countries and the repercussions on this family. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I'm so glad I read it. I'm so glad I read it now and I'm so glad I read it with so many wonderful people. So if you participated in the, the group read, even if you didn't uh, say anything, but you were just there with us in spirit and kind of listening along, thank you. Um, it's, it wasn't easy, but I'm glad that we did it. And uh, your insights were magnificent. And speaking of group reads, uh, so when this goes up, I'll have one more day that, this, that I will be keeping open the group uh, joining for this. This will be for next month in September. We're gonna be reading The Books of Jacob by Olga Tcharczyk. And this was translated by Jennifer Croft. So this will be the September read. Again, only one more day to join. I'll put a link to uh, the form to join in uh, and I'll be setting this up uh, on the first. Then uh, for October, the group read is gonna be the Balkan Trilogy by Olivia Manning. So I will put a link to this sign up as well. So that's ahead. Let me talk about what I'm reading right now because I've got a few books on the go. I'm reading with Leo of A Little Book Life, I'm reading a book that I've been wanting to read for so many years, scared to read because I was afraid it was going to be the exact opposite of what it is. This is A Passage to India by E.M. Forster. I talked about finding this as a series uh, when I was at, in London and being so happy. Uh, this is oh, this is not a colonial um, setup. This is a colonial dis destruction story. Uh, we open what what's most interesting about about how Forster chooses to set this up. It's really about the framing, right? So the frame, the first the first chapter is just about the setting, no people. Uh, um, it's just about the environment, the setting how people have created the setting and the place and the place and how they're leveraging and what, what it says about where people live, about their social status. 
And then we go immediately into meeting the Indian characters and meeting a group of men that are all very good friends uh, that are well established in Indian culture and are interacting with the English that are there. This is during colonial times, so British are still occupying India. Uh, and then we meet uh, two women who have arrived and it's a mother and a potential daughter-in-law who has come to see her son and potential husband. And they are filled with wonder and wanting to see India and wanting to meet real Indians. And uh, to, as you can imagine, uh, pretty interesting results. We're not very far into the book. We're kind of taking it five chapters at a time, but the writing's exquisite, as I expected from Forrester. Uh, the framing, though, the framing is what's getting me right now, and, and I'm, I'm quite impressed. So thrilled to be reading this with Leo. <clears throat> then lastly, I am reading this. This is Eight Detectives by Alex Pal Pavesi, and I think this is the eighth detective in the... American version. Uh, I got this when I was, uh, I think I got this when I was in Europe. Um, yeah, I'm almost positive I did. Uh, this is uh, kind of one of those setups where the way the story is told is very interesting. We've got a reclusive writer who lives uh, in isolation. We have an editor who's gone to meet him and she's talking to him about a set of short stories or a, a, a book that he wrote that is set up of individual murder mystery stories that seem to be set independent of each other. And she's pressing him, him about something. And it's all going, to, I have a feeling that this is uh, going to end up connecting us to something else and, and culminating in something that's going to happen. Uh, but right now, uh, it's interestingly written. It's it's a it's a thinker's uh, mystery. So it's not a lot of. It's very cozy in that it's not a lot of blood or bloodshed. There are some gruesome gruesome parts in the murder, but nothing uh, too extreme. Uh, but you have to pay attention. Uh, there's a lot of detection and and um, foreshadowing and things like that. So I'm enjoying it. Uh, and yeah, so we'll see where this one goes. So that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you've had a great week of reading. Please let me know if you've read any of these, uh, what your thoughts were. Do you have any like these that you would recommend to me? And that's it. I'll look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you for watching. Bye.